panel on getting involved in open source, uh, and that was originally proposed by our communications person, Scott Kennedy, and I jumped on it because, as it happens, I have uh, written articles on it for places like Full Circle Magazine and have recorded programs for public radio on the topic. So it's one near and dear to my heart. And I thought, well, let's find some awesome people to come and talk about this. So I I'm just a moderator. Uh, so I'm going to let them really do most of the talking. Um, I'm going to moderate this according to the John Scalzi rules. So the John Scalzi rules are uh, until about 10.30, I want the panelists to do all the talking, hold your questions, and then about 10.30, I'll start soliciting questions from people. Okay? So, why don't we start with some introductions? <coughs> William? Uh, Bill Rowe. Um, William A. Rowe, Jr. I'm not being pretentious. It's just that there are 300, 400 uh, Bill Rows in the world, um, and I wanted to be able to go back and search for my own posts. Responses. I'm Emily Gagner. Oh. Why are you here? Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, Apache, uh, Apache Web Server uh, happens to be my project, and uh, from that I ended up uh, helping run the foundation. I'm Emily Gagner. I am a longtime user of free software. I started with GNU Linux, I honestly don't know when, in the mid to late 90s sometime. Never forget the look on my brother's face when I asked if I could delete Windows and install this thing called Linux for the first time. <laughs> I was about 13, 14, he was 15, 16. The obvious answer was no. <laughs> Led to many years of attempted installs. Some more accidental deletions than others, but you'll have that. I've been contributing back for about four years now. I originally got involved with the Genome you know, Outreach Program for Women. I'm Ruth Seeley. This is Invisible Tom Calloway. <laughs> <laughs> he stepped out for a minute, but for a good reason. He and I uh, co-authored a book called Raspberry Pi Hacks last year, and we have a bunch of copies to give away, so uh, he went to get them. He, we're with on Red Hat's open source and standards team. I manage our community leadership team. He uh, has a team working on education outreach and used to be the Fedora engineering manager. I've been at Red Hat about eight years, started on the brand team. He's been there since, I don't know, the beginning of time, 14 years, I think he said yesterday. <laughs> uh, that's kind of our thing. Cool. So, it's about getting involved in open source. You've talked a little bit about how each of you first got involved. Uh, so, what are some of the, if, you, if you're all involved in projects, let's have some examples of things that uh, you typically are looking to have people get involved in. Um, so, do you want to start, Bill? Sure. Um, so, as I say, my, my intro was, was the web server. So, this is actually the server side. It's not so user-facing, um, although people get really upset when they go and they say, my website was taken over by Apache. Um, you stole my... Uh, all my favorite uh, forums or whatever. Um, so it's interesting, the people who collaborate uh, in that space tend to be sysadmins, they tend to have a technical knowledge already. So we, I guess we have it easier in some ways than, than uh, uh, UI would. Um, and that tends to also reflect the Apache Foundations, it just it attracts projects that are related to infrastructure, that are related to operations and such, but we, we always are looking to draw in uh, more participants just because um, there's always doc. First of all, we're horrible at naming things, just as a rule. Uh, we're horrible at documenting, and uh, uh, we're not always the most tactical when it comes to interacting with users on the user list. And this is really where probably the most important thing, I think, in terms of uh, participating in open source is just the peer-to-peer -peer nature of it, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of, of supporting other users. And you know, you, you get there, you don't you only get there for one reason, and that is I have a question that I need to answer. But hopefully you, you get that answer and as you're looking around and you see other people with questions that hey, I know that answer. Maybe I should maybe I should uh, throw that out there. Uh, there aren't enough hours in the day for us to, to answer those questions. It's funny you say naming, I always thought Apache was one of the word lover names. Oh, thank 
<laughs> we, yeah, we, we can go off on that ten. We want to make sure we address everything. Um, I I mostly work on GNOME still. I was originally got involved contributing to the app for employment in late 2011. Um, I was a marketing team. It's now the engagement team. Uh, intern with them. I wrote large portions of the what was it, 2010, 2011. You know, annual report hadn't been done for two years, <laughs> so that was most of my project was writing and, and editing, um, getting a hold of all of the many contributors and saying, "What did you do for the last two years?" That's important. What what's gone on? Um, that was most of my project. Uh, I was then a summer of code student and wrote you know uh, clocks with Safe Lotfi and Alan Day and several other guys um, and. I've stayed involved with GNOME, not quite as much as I used to be now. I, I contribute in small ways to a lot of things. Mostly I do documentation, a lot of editing to be honest. Um, a lot of editing and writing. This echoes what they said, but I want not fewer developers, but more of the other stuff. We got pockets of developers. I want documentation people and marketing people and design people because uh, code monkeys are neat, but they're usually terrible designers and writers. <laughs> uh, I take your part. <laughs> <laughs> personal offense. <laughs> yeah, I think she's speaking the truth. <laughs> well, and of course there are a handful of exceptions. There are magical people in this world who are good at absolutely everything they do, and that's awesome. And they should do whatever makes them happy. But on the whole, code people are terrible designers. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that you said. It's funny that you said that because. They're primarily editing, but I mean that is the number one thing. I mean, very often we will spit, you know, given given enough encouragement or frustration, <coughs> frustration, we will kick out a few pages of docs. Right, but often they're semi-intelligible unless you know what they're supposed to say. Right. Unless I, I and and that's what I, I've done a lot of going back and saying. So wait, you're trying to say this, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. What one of Apache's uh, women in code, and also. Uh, 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 writer, uh, uh, wordsmith, uh, goes by, she goes by the title of um, uh, Geek uh, Human Translator. Yeah, that, that would make sense. <laughs> That's a good skill. <laughs> Tom has taken off his poking device. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like from new contributors? Uh, patience. <laughs> Honestly, there's too many people I see that they show up and they're like, hey, I wrote this awesome patch. And then I'm like, well, let's talk about why this is not awesome. And then they're like, no, my patch is great. If you don't like it, go away. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, and I think patience applies to both sides. So you want you want the new contributor to be patient with everybody else because they're learning how everything works. And you know, if they're not going to stick around long enough to help me help them understand how they can fit in successfully. You know, and then the flip side, you want all the existing contributors to be able to have patience with the new people. And that's a, a big challenge as well. Yeah, I, I suspect in a lot of ways that's the bigger challenge to get people who have been there a while to, to give me patience, to get up to speed on what what it is that you're trying to say. Yeah, you, know, you just, you just, just uh, remind me of something. I mean, one of the things that the Apache group uh, needs the most of is, and never can put it put their hands on enough, are mentors. And I mean, that's actually now an official role on the incubating side of the projects coming in, is that we must have mentors. Must have multiple mentors to, to bring that community in. Mentors for, for new people to bring into the community? Uh, when, when, when there's a code submission, when there's a new project offered um, uh, entirely distinct from other existing projects, um, not, only do we need, not only do we need to have a, uh, uh, a, a committee of, of people who are going to work on that code, but we actually need some other folks in the foundation who can remain relatively neutral. You kind of alluded to the, the whole problem of my interests and I don't like a patch and such. So it kind of helps that our mentors, when, as we recruit them, don't have a, a direct interest. I, I just took on uh, uh, Project Geo over there. Um, and that's going to be what was commercial gem fire. And we're trying to teach uh, people, who happens to be in my company, Pivotal, trying to teach them, okay, now you're going to do this in open, now you're going to use this, now you're going to use public fund tracker. No, we're not going to keep a private uh, tech discussion list. So. I had an experience with the LibreOffice documentation. I was reviewing something that had already been written, and I went over it about 10 times, and 
finally wrote back to the list, I have no idea what they're talking about here. I've got the software in front of me, I'm trying to follow it, I've gone over it and over it and over it. It makes no sense at all. I actually found a project where the, the documentation, like it was label documentation, but it was actually the history of the project, and I was like, that's not the same mom. <laughs> and I tweeted, I don't understand your thing, and then they helped me over Twitter, which was helpful and yet not helpful in a broader sense. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we, we've talked about mentoring, we've talked about documentation, um, any other? Well, just, just your experience yeah. uh, applies to code too, believe me. We've mm -hmm. gone through plenty of pages pages of uh, function uh, that don't seem to be used anymore. And yeah, so there, we, we have equally unintelligible code, just like the unintelligible docs. Um, but we do need developers. I mean, I, I, I we've spent a lot of time talking about it editing and all these other great things that the projects need, but I mean, we do need coders. But you were just, you mentioned something fun, which was just how do you react, how do, how do we react when we're in a project and we throw the patch over the wall and um, sometimes it's, you know, met with some hostility or sometimes, and you got to remember that, you know, the people in this project, for the most part, were the guys who wrote this code. So, you know, they're, they're done to the stink. And so there's absolutely no way that that's a bug, but of course, if you're using it, you know already that it doesn't work. So, um, but there's a certain amount of tact, I think, and it's got a couple of ways. Yeah, one of the things I've learned over the years is that when I find what I know in my heart to be honest to God a bug, and I've got the patch, and it fixes it, and everything is right in my universe, that is not the attitude I should take when I'm filing that bug upstream, is that I need to be phrasing it very much in the sense of, I found this, it looks like a bug to me, I wrote this patch, I think it's correct, please look it over. If you send it that way, 99% of the time, if upstream responds, they respond positively. Even if you've done everything wrong, they usually take the time and go, okay, well, I see why you think that, but let's talk about why that's not at all the case, and why that's actually the intended behavior. Uh, I actually had one of my first kernel patches that I wrote, that I sent up, uh, I wrote it in that way, and. I got flamed because it's Linux kernel mailing list, but I could have been flamed a lot worse had I phrased it the way I felt it was. I felt like, yeah, I'm fixing this bug. I can't believe no one has fixed it like this before. <laughs> but I, I think you say we need more of this, we need more of that. What we really need is to find better ways of reaching new contributors. And I don't have the magical solution to that, or if we'd have done it already. Uh, but <laughs> I started using hard. Linux in like, 98, 99, when some guy in my dorm was like, here's this thing, and it was probably another eight or 10 years before I realized that that was something you could help with. <laughs> I feel like there should have been a flashing slide somewhere along the way. And if anything, I feel like it should be getting more obvious as, as open source becomes more prevalent, like everybody knows what Firefox is, except I think that's actually a problem because now it all just looks like software to everybody. And there's even less of a clue that this is something that you could be a part of. One of the things that I do for my day job at Red Hat is education outreach, and that's one of the ways that we're trying to solve that broader identifying new contributor market problem. The average CS graduate in the United States doesn't know what open source is. Uh, and so we're spending a lot of time and effort trying to figure out uh, where we can spend our time, our money, and our manpower to effectively reach out to those students and say, hey, let's have a conversation about what open source is. Even if you never ever get involved with it, even if you never do it, you should at least be aware of its existence. Understand this ecosystem exists so that when you encounter it again, not if, but when, you'll be better prepared to deal with it, hopefully. For some reason lately, I'm sorry. I, I think communication is a key thing. It's what a lot of free software projects really kind of suck at, is communicating with each other and with their existing contributors, let alone with the outside world to try and encourage other people to contact them. That's what I, there's a lot of projects that, yeah, you can contribute to Firefox, you can contribute to GNOME, but how easy is it to figure out how to? Not very. It's not, <laughs> easy. If, you know, you go, to the, you go to Mozilla's website, is there a big contribute? But, well, if there is, they're asking for money. Right. They're not asking for you to step in and help out somehow. A lot of these projects are really huge, and even just figuring out that you can contribute is rather hard. A lot, most people know that, that Mozilla is open source or free software, or at least a lot of people do. But figuring out how to give back is really, really hard. Although that does cut both ways because the people who do want to make a donation get angry when they can. 
follow the contributing button link right. only to find out, well, I'm not going to write a patch, but I just want to. Find some. I want to give you money. You can both of those things on one page. Right. Yeah. Here's the money button. Right. Here's how you give us your time. Right. Yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a usability problem, not just in the software, but in the actual website. And so many websites or projects have the most unusable websites on demand. Yes. You, you spend 20 minutes trying to figure out where the source code is. Like right. I said, we can't we can't name things. We're not good at documenting things, and we're horrible. Communicating. Uh, structure works. And then the other big problem that ties into communication is when the community is non-responsive to incoming issues at all. And if they're all operating code and you can see that their their Git repository is tracking changes and there's there's life there, but every time someone posts the mailing list it goes unresponded to. When when someone submits a new issue, it goes unresponded to. Then those people don't stick around to figure out how to get on the how to identify where they can contribute because there's no outreach to that. That's the sort of thing where you, as a you know, an active community person, you've got to be reaching out to the rest of the people and like, hey, we need to make a conscious effort to reach out to these people and at least acknowledge that they exist. Even if we're not able to fix their bug right now, even if we're not able to do these things, we need to go, yeah, I see that, okay, we'll take a look at that. That's all you have to say on a bug. And that's all you have to say to someone is, yeah, I see that, okay, well, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Right. And, and I think, you know, saying that you don't respond to mailing lists, well, how hard is it to find a mailing list to, do I if I if I'm just trying to report a bug, do I really want to subscribe to some mailing list that I'm now going to get flooded with spam? Essentially, that 99% of it I don't care about. That's what I, I, I don't. I, for the last several years since becoming involved, I've never understood why free software projects are so against forums. Forums are really easy for most people that use the internet. Most oh, most kids today use Twitter. They use Facebook. They can get on a form and write a post and reply to stuff and read stuff without having to subscribe to the mailing list. And yeah, those mailing lists are archived online, but searching searching through archives is. I think. Where's my well, <laughs> Yeah, so HyperKitty is the project that you know Red Hat uh, threw down on to try to uh, ameliorate this problem so that we, if you like forums, you got forums. If you like mailing lists, you got mailing lists. You're talking to the same people on the same channel. Right. Um, and that just landed with Mailman 3, so that is actually a real thing now. Work to make it awesome, but it's a start at least. Yeah. Um, but I think that what we have is this. I don't know how it came to be. I don't know how it happened, but you have this mindset among the traditional folks that have been doing it for a while that they'd much rather have this come to them in their mailbox so that they can, at their leisure, identify, filter, and sift. Right. And a forum's not going to let you do that. A forum, you're going to have to go and check and read through all the threads to see if there's anything that mentions you. Whereas for a while, when I was working aggressively on Chromium, I was just firehosing a whole bunch of mailing lists into a folder, which once a month I would literally type keyword searches into, see if anything was relevant to me that I needed to reply to, and if not, just nuke the whole file. If I had to do that in a forum structure, it would be very painful, because a lot of the forum searches just don't work. Yeah, I, th I think that it does get lost on users. I mean, we're talking about the, 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 the patience is required both ways, but both. Uh, as a consumer user that's just communicating with, with the project, and the project people communicate with that. But I, I don't think most people who are just users realize the, the volume that, of the email that, and, and inquiries that folks do. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm rather rude and curt when the folks email me directly and I'll just, I'll simply fire back a, a note saying, please ask me this again on the public forum, if only so that my answer can go to everybody who searches it after you ask it. And it's that, because I, we don't have time to be personal support desk to all of these individuals, you know, that really do want our help, and we really do like to help. It's just do it in a public way, use a public forum, so that down is, you know, believe me, I I run into problems all day. I, I'm I, I'm a Fedora user, so of course I find problems all day. <laughs> 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 so I turn around and I find somebody's blog post, or I find the mailing list conversation. If I'm lucky, otherwise now I'm, I'm asking questions. I, I'm an Ubuntu user. It, I have been for a long time, and so I, I, if I have problems, I type Ubuntu and whatever my problems into Google, and up pops the forum post. Right. If there's any, if anybody else has had this issue, which is rather likely, up pops a forum thread that I can read through and go, oh. I can do that, or that didn't work for me, 
am I on a later version or an earlier version or what do I do to fix it? And, and usually I'll get a reply back. Even if it's a thread that's months or a year old, someone replies. Someone gets an alert yeah. that, hey, somebody else posted in this, in this thread and somebody replies. It might be four years old. But I think right. It, it, it's an important point, though. If you do encounter frustration from, from the project community, um, you, you should ask yourself, did I bother to at least do a decent Google search? I yeah. mean, did, am I asking something that is ridiculously obvious if I only typed in? And we don't, I, I stopped using it, but I did think it was really funny. Uh, uh, LMG, FY, let me Google that for you. Yeah. Um, really cute, too over the top snarky. I, I just quit it, but it's true. Well, that's true of anything you want to help on, not just Linux. Like, yeah, if you're a costumer and you get on my board and you say, Where do I buy Warbler? I'm, just, I'm not even gonna answer. Like, just Google Warbler, seriously. Yeah, we have, a, we, have a, we have an ask uh, site where you can go to ask after a project and you can ask a question and people will try to answer the question. And there's a huge pile of people that ask things like, My, my laptop uh, doesn't come back from hibernation, help. <laughs> I want to help you, but you've given me so little. It's like I can't breathe. All right. <laughs> and for a while, for a while there, uh, I would take some time in my day, and I would literally just go through this pile of posts, and I would be like, "All right, you got to tell me a lot more about your system, everything you're doing, what it costs, what, what you're running, what version it is, all of this stuff. What did you do to it?" and I would have to say I got maybe two replies out of about 200 where people would follow up and would say, oh yeah, well this is my thing. Yeah, I don't know where the common sense gap fails there. Where you, where you think that I'm magically going, you go, oh yeah, just turn that down to 11 and it'll all work great. <laughs> like we turned that off, like Hibernate was a special feature we have to hack on for everybody. It kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my pet peeve, less so from new people, but from existing community members, is when they email a mailing list and say, somebody should, blah. And I just replied, that's a great idea, you should do that. You just volunteer. <laughs> <it here. laughs> For the record, that's how I ended up doing all Fedora's licenses, so. Somebody has to. Somebody should do that. <laughs> yes! All you. I wonder sometimes if the language we use gets in the way of this because when we talk about free software, we've got this whole what do we mean by free problem. We talk about open source, you know, how many people actually will ever look at the source code of anything, realistically? That's not really what I think we should be focusing on. Um, I've always said if we call it community supported software, we'd at least be a little closer to explaining what it is we're trying to accomplish. When I try to solve that problem with, with students, because that's a problem they don't get, if I, if I, if I go up in front of them and talk about free software this, free software that, free software movement, which I believe in, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of it, but they just think that it's like Facebook. That, that doesn't cost me anything, it's free. They don't get that, that freedom versus cost discussion. So instead of doing that, I, I talk about control. And I talk about the fact that we don't want the hoods on our cars welded shut. But most of us are never going to pop the hood if it's our own car. We just don't have the skill to do it anymore. But should we be so passionate to just say one day, hey, I'm going to rebuild my engine from scratch? We can. That option is there. You have that control. You can take your car to someone else and go, hey, I'd like you to fix my engine, please. And not just have to go to the dealership and go, well, that engine's dead. You're, we can't take it out. We're going to have to get you a new car. Actually, you can't because GM um, yeah, is copyrighted <laughs> on the software. I may have to change the analogy thanks to. <laughs> Well, and, and you guys can disagree. I, somebody asked me this uh, in a podcast interview a couple weeks ago about the whole free open source thing, and I said, I, outside of that core, seriously dedicated people who really feel strongly about that word free, I, nobody talks about this. Uh, we do at 11 billion conferences a year, as a rough estimate, yeah? Uh, and I, I can't even think of the last time I had a conversation about open source versus free. No, I do know exactly when it was. Um, uh, Peter Brown at LinuxCon in 2007. <laughs> no, I, I agree, and, and when I when I give my little my little song and dance, I, one of my slides is I, I will take 10 seconds and explain free software because you're going to hear this term, and then I'm going to use it interchangeably with open source for the rest of the time. And if you don't like that, okay. uh, although I think some of it now, fortunately, we're some Linux users up here, but uh, I think that Windows as a not not, not the operating system, but as an ecosystem, um, really kind of muddy this because folks 
the kids, you know, they've grown up, they've been using shareware all this time, and that, right. that is not open source. Some of it is, but for the most, for the vast majority of it, it's here's this great little program I can download for free, and it doesn't. Even, this one doesn't even have pop-up. That's great. Um, and like you said, very much like the browser too. But you know, the, the shareware is not. Uh, shareware versus freeware versus free software. Are, right. They're different things. Exactly. It's, and but it, it it does get confusing, especially like you say to kids. And actually, I think kids is where we need to focus. Uh, I mean, if if we want people to use free software. 10 years from now, we need to start advertising and recruiting kids when they're in elementary school and middle school and not wait until they get to college and into computer science. Because at that point, mm -hmm. we've lost them. They're already tied into Apple products or they're tied into Windows, and we've lost them. They're, they're not going to throw all that stuff away and move to Linux. They're just not. Well, I, I myself, uh, you know, getting on in years, and it's like, no, of course we need the kids, mostly because they're the only ones with the energy to keep their day job, uh, or to keep their, their school schedule, do their night job, and then put 20 hours a week into coding, um, because they really want to accomplish something. Um, in the Apache Foundation, I mean, we, my favorite expression always is, you know, these projects are all built around individuals who are scratching their own itch. You're, you're editing docs because the docs irritate you. And so you, you jump on it and you're like, now I gotta do it. Somebody has to do it. So you're doing licensing right now. Everyone at the project in some way or another is scratching their own itch. So that means if something really isn't bothering a single project community member, your patch, your idea might just it might get ignored. And and the biggest thing for us as a community is to say, yeah, you know what? That is a really good idea, and we're gonna entertain your contribution. You know what? We'd like you to join the project. Because we don't have anybody doing it. We, we, we don't have that marketing function. That's just not going to fulfill right now in our project. And we need one more person here just to do that. Since, since you offered. Yeah. Where's that spare marketing person? Can you send them over? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it goes, it goes both ways, too, because we've done a lot of things in Fedora to try to recruit people to areas that are underserved, under-supported. And sometimes we get people that want to make videos that we don't want to make. Okay, well, so this is actually an entire other question, is what happens when you have a contributor who is doing a really terrible job, but you can't fire volunteers? <laughs> like, you, we actually look worse because of what you made, and I don't know how to tell you that. <laughs> it's not good. It's really bad. And I, I don't want to be the guy that has to come up to him and be like, please stop. Just no, no more. Because <laughs> that's, that's, that's negative, and I know that, but so is what he's doing. And so it's... I, that, well, it's just, just a matter of how you present it. You know, it's, it, it's like... You know, if you're a boss or a supervisor, and, you're, and one of your employees is not doing something right, you got to tell them that, hey, here's what's going wrong, and, well, how, and maybe suggest how to correct it. It can be so you, you can do you can do anything as long as you present it the right way. Let's let's assume though for a moment that you, you, it is important. I mean, it's just, this is not video editing is just not their forte. To, to use your example, and you just need to steer them in a different direction. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons, and we neglected this subject throughout all of the open source communities until about seven years ago. And then we got to the district. But you can have the code. You can, you went great to get to keep both pieces. It's our brand. So, and, and this, this really gets important in that, you know, we, we have all of these commercial interests um, that, that are interested in exploiting it. Red Hat with, with uh, Fedora, with uh, Linux, um, uh, the uh, Pivotal uh, folks. You know, we're doing Hadoop, we're doing all these pieces. We've got to be really careful not to use these brands. I mean, the, the brand is the projects. And so when they're making a video and it's the food project, and it's like, you know what? I don't want you to make that video as the food project. That's not really who you are. I, we love your, fa you, we would love it if you do a fan video, if you do your own thing. But you, know, you, you can't represent that you are the project. Well, and, and, but that's a corollary problem, is people who go out to events and say, I am representing X project, when maybe you didn't necessarily want that person representing your project, but there's only so much you can do if you even knew about it. And sometimes the community doesn't know that that person shouldn't be representing the project. There have been plenty of cases where the way that Fedora is, the size of Fedora is such that we have a whole group of people that are uh, 
self-sustaining with regards to who sends people to what, who pays for what, and when someone who should not be talking about the project because they say things that aren't true, and uh, but they get funded because the community goes, hey, he's passionate, let's, let's send him. We don't know that he, they don't know who this person is. And so there's this whole continuing cycle of, well, he did the last event, he must have been good, we'll do it again. And so we end up sometimes having to, to forcefully blacklist people out, and, and then the community gets really aggressive with, why are you blacklisting this guy? Well, we don't want to, but we've tried to work with them to not say false things in conferences. But So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of dynamic, especially once you get to a bigger size. I think the smaller open source communities don't have that problem as often as larger ones do. Well, when five people shut out one person, it's easier than when 20,000 people are like, 